Well, David Reisman was a professor of sociology at Harvard University in the 1950s. You've probably never heard of him, even if you're a sociologist. But he obtained a measure of fame in that day by being the first sociologist to be featured on the cover of Time magazine. And the reason for that is that he published a, a study that was called The Lonely Crowd. The Lonely Crowd was a study of character in Western culture, something that had not really been done before that and something really that's seldom been done since. And Reisman presented four categories into which our character falls as individuals within the current cultural milieu. He first identified the tradition-directed character, the inner-directed character, the outer-directed character, and finally the autonomous character. Tradition-directed, of course, is governed by things of the past, the way we have done things and traditions handed down. Inner, being driven by that inner compass to know what is right and what is wrong and what to do. Outer-directed means our character and our values are driven by others within our peer group or models within society. And finally, autonomous means we want to set what we value ourselves, and that is the shaper of our character. The interesting thing is that in the years since this study was done, sociologists of future generations have noticed a marked decline in the number of individuals that fall into the tradition and inner directed categories, and a sharp increase in those falling into the outer directed and particularly autonomous character categories. What this means is that people's character is decreasingly being shaped by the Judeo-Christian values on which Western culture was founded, decreasingly being shaped by the inner voice of conscience, and more shaped by what other people think, and even more shaped by the, desi by the desire of the individual to set his own standards for what is right and what is wrong, what is moral and what is just, apart from any absolute moral Standard. Christian author and social critic Oz Guinness commented on this phenomenon in his book that's called When No One Sees, the importance of, of, of character in an age of image. And he gave this assessment. This is what Guinness says. He says, contemporary America is experiencing a rise in anonymity and a decline in accountability, a major cause of the erosion of character. In a mobile, modern society like the United States, or Canada for that matter, I would say, more people at more times and in more places are more anonymous than at any previous time in human history. The resulting pressures on character are obvious. Now, what Reisman first documented 60 years ago and what Guinness highlighted 15 years ago may not actually be obvious to us in 2014 because the decline has slipped so far. The reality has not changed, of course, that this is the decline of character in our very culture. It's declined so far that character is barely even mentioned as something to be cultivated or developed in school or institution or media today. We are so ingrained in our own personal freedom in defining for ourselves what is important on the one hand, while on the other desperately trying to conform to what the culture tells us is right, the standards of the world and to obtain the elusive money and power and status and objects of desire. But for the Christian, for the Christian, character is foundational. It's foundational to the life of the disciple. It's developing and shaping our character, conforming to the very image of Christ that is the operating principle of discipleship. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And what is character? Well, Dr. Guinness tells us in the title of his, of his book, it's what you do when no one sees. More accurately, what you do when no one sees is a reflection of your true inner heart, of who you are. And who you are is what Jesus wants to get to. It's what he wants to mold and shape for his, his very own. So this morning we're going to talk about the transition from becoming a disciple 
to being a disciple. Last week, we started by, by saying Jesus set forth the conditions of becoming his disciple and the things we need to consider before embarking on that journey with him. You remember we learned that Jesus was addressing the crowds. He's addressing the masses, not his existing disciples. And so his conditions were those for becoming a believer. That was the cost of discipleship. Now, make no mistake, this is not a recipe for earning discipleship. As though we have to do certain things in order to merit being Jesus' disciple. We know from Ephesians 2 verse 8, for by, the great, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. So becoming a Christian is free, but becoming a disciple is a costly business indeed. That's what we learned last week. And now we're going to find out what happens to us once we become a disciple. The answer, of course, is that we're in need of instruction. The word for disciple is actually learner. That's what it means, learner in the original language, in the Greek. And how do we learn? Well, we need to be taught. We need to be shown what to do. And that's exactly what Jesus established the church to do, to make and teach disciples. And Titus chapter 2 is a classic passage on teaching in the church. And that's where I want to direct our attention to this morning. Would you turn with me to Titus chapter 2? The book of Titus is right after 2 Timothy. And the second chapter of Titus is actually divided into two sections, the specifics and the generalization, the detail and the summary. I'm going to focus on the generalization this morning, which is found in verses 11 to 15, but you can see some of the specifics of the teaching, some of the practical and day-to-day in verses 1 to 10. The whole passage is included in your Digging Deeper questions this week so you can sink your teeth into it, spend some time studying the particular instances that Paul gives. They're very important. But for our immediate study right now, we're going to look at the generalization, uh, the generalized portion of this text, which begins at verse 11. So let me read this passage of scripture for you. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to the end of the chapter. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people and training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works." Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. This is the word of the Lord. The first thing we notice in verse 11 is the word for. It's the very first word. And this word for connects this section to the previous section. When you're studying verses 1 to 10 in the week that's coming up, you're going to see that Paul gives a number of of, of segments of the church specific instructions for what they need to learn. And he tells Titus, this is what these groups need to learn. This is what the old men need to learn. This is what the young men need to learn. This is what the ladies need to learn. So now he's saying in verse 11, okay, here's what I told you to teach. Now this is how we're going to teach it. And this is why it's important. Let me show you the why and the how of this teaching. If you look at verses 1 to 10, you'll find that this is about character of disciples. It's about how we live, who we are, and how that flows out of us. The other thing that you'll notice about the the, the language in verse 11 is that he shifts from a more colloquial language to a higher style, a more formal style of writing. And the reason he does that is because he is now going to go into a theological discourse. He's told Titus the practical. Now he's going to tell him the theology behind it rather than just the day-to-day operation. So it signifies how important this section is that we're coming into in verses 11 to 15. It's about how we get the character of the disciple. What is done to accomplish that? Okay, here we go. The first thing is this. It's training. It's training. It starts off by saying, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us. Now, before we get to the training itself, I want to just point out Two things. 
The first thing is that it is the grace of God that is training us. Did you notice that? He says, the grace of God has appeared, comma, bringing salvation to all people, comma, training us. So it's the grace of God that's doing the training. This is very important to realize. Because the change that comes in the life of the disciple, the growth that we experience and the application of right teaching in our lives, all comes as a result of the grace of God. It's by God's grace that we change. Grace doesn't just bring salvation, it trains us. Grace is not just the vehicle of salvation for us, it's God's grace that actually instructs us and causes us to grow in our lives as disciples. This is profound because it reminds us that no matter what comes next, no matter what instruction or teaching or modeling or practice or spiritual disciplines, no matter matter what tactics are used for living the life of the disciple, all growth that takes place is solely wrought by the grace of God. We don't earn it. We don't merit it. We don't deserve it. God just gives it to us. He gives it to us. Just like the whole rest of his plan of salvation, for his own glory. And that's why Paul is careful to say, after he instructs Titus what to teach, don't forget, man, that everything you're teaching is going to see its fruit by the grace of God. It's God who is doing the real work. He's the one who brings the increase. So the grace of God brings salvation, but it also brings the subsequent training. And that's the second thing I want you to notice. Training itself implies that we have work to do. So on the one hand, you have God's grace is giving you everything that you need. On the other hand, you're going to have to do some work. That's a bit of a tension. It's a bit of a tension. We're going to figure out how that actually works. As I was driving home a couple days ago, I had to take a detour because there was some construction. And I was driving um, down Tremaine Road in Milton, coming up towards where where we live, and I noticed this enormous oval building on on the left-hand side that I hadn't actually seen before. I knew about it. But I hadn't seen it before, and it was pretty impressive. You know what it was? Is the velodrome, right? It's the cycling venue, indoor cycling for the Pan Am Games that are coming in 2015. It's pretty impressive, and I got a little excited because you know from last week that I, I had a bit of an athletic background, and, and that kind of stuff gets me excited. And I was thinking about the athletes who are going to be coming into this big, cool building to do their high-level performance, This is in 2015 that the games are coming. What do you think those athletes are doing right now? Yeah, they're training. (laughs) They're training. They're not just sitting around waiting for next year to come, even though they probably already know whether they're going to be here or not. They know whether they're on the team. They're still training now. They have to do some work in order to get to the goal. And Paul uses the the metaphor of athleticism repeatedly when he's talking about the Christian life. This is just another example, another reminder that there is work involved in the process of being a disciple. And the present participle tense that's used in the word training in that verse tells us that it's an ongoing activity. The training is going to continue. It's not like we we do it and then we kind of go through our boot camp for discipleship and then we're kind of done. Training is the life of the disciple. So this time, the focus of Paul here as he's he's talking to Titus and telling him how to train the disciples in in, in Crete, his focus is on the fact that training comes by God's grace to us. And what is he training us to do? What is the content? He's training us to build our character. He's training us to build our character by saying no so that we can say yes. We are training to say no so that we can say yes. There is both a negative and a positive aspect to our character development as disciples. This is the content of our character. This is what we're training to do. And you see it in verse 12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. The negative starts with the things we need to move away from. Renounce ungodliness. You know what ungodliness is? Ungodliness is explicit opposition to God's truth. You can see this in Romans 1, 18, where, where Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed against, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They are willfully 
They are willfully suppressing and opposing God. That's, un, that, that's ungodliness. Worldly passions, on the other hand, is what we orient to once we've suppressed the truth of God. So on the one hand, we're saying no to God, we're opposing him so that we can pursue worldly passions. Worldly passions represent our own selfishness, our own orientation towards self. Notice that you, notice that you have both, both aspects. You have, you have related ungodliness to God against God, so that you can pursue worldly passions for yourself. This is important because we talked about last week in our uh, Bible doctrines class, you can't define sin apart from God. Defining sin purely as selfishness is is an insufficient definition. We need to remember the component of sin that rejects God and willfully opposes him, and then in his place tries to substitute something else, which in this case is worldly passions. Those are the fleshly desires that are spelled out by Paul, for example, in Galatians 5. In Galatians 5, he says, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. You'll notice that not everything in that list is a behavior. A lot of those things are attitudes, are character qualities, are works of the heart. So we're, we're orienting ourselves away from God and toward worldly passions. We need to renounce that. We need to suppress that. We need to get rid of that as our character is being shaped for Christ. That is the negative. The negatives are the character traits we're moving away from so that we can move to the positive. We're being taught to imbibe the positive characteristics. And what are they? Well, they're self-control upright and godly living. That's a short list. Paul certainly expounds on this list, other places in scripture, talking about the fruit of the spirit and and other things like that. But this is a really good summary. It's a good summary because he talks about our lives being disciplined, under control, keeping God's command, which is righteousness and living uprightly, and oriented toward God. It's godly living. The interesting thing is that's also a description of Christ, isn't it? That's how he lived. He lived the disciplined life. He was in control of his faculties at all times. He lived an upright life, an obedient life to God, fulfilling all of the commands of God and never once entering into sin. And his life was godly because he was oriented constantly toward the will of God and keeping God's will in his life. That is the way Christ lived. And we already know that the objective of the disciple is to become like the master, like Christ. So that's the content of our character. That's what we're being taught to do. One thing that's really interesting about the way Paul chooses to present this content is of the character of the disciple is he frames it in language of the Greek philosophers. These virtues are, are this, are the same as the way that the Greeks were presenting the ideal virtues that we should strive for as humans. He's using the language of the Greek philosophers. When Paul cites self-control, upright living, and godly living, he's alluding to those Greek ideals. Why is he doing that? What's going on here? Is it a situation where Paul is redefining the Greek ideals so that they will fit with Christian truth? Is he trying to plug Christianity into Greek thought? I don't think so. Is it a case where the Greek philosophers have simply stumbled upon God's natural truth and it just so happens that whatever they identify is, is true because God, all God's truth is true? Well, that, that's probably true, but I don't think that's what he's shooting at here. I think what's actually happening, happening here is Paul is borrowing the language of the Greek philosophers in order to contextualize his teaching. Remember where Titus is. Where is he? He's in Crete. He's on the island of Crete. This is a Greek cultural backdrop. Titus is leading all the churches on the island of Crete. And so what Paul is doing here is he's, he, what he does so often, and you can see this in the book of Acts, he starts using a common reference point that the Greeks would relate to in his preaching in order to make the gospel message clear. Without compromising the integrity of the message, he uses a starting point that we can relate to so that he can present the gospel. So there's a bit of teaching methodology here in Paul's instruction to Titus. 
As he describes the content, we say no so that we can say yes. He also describes a little bit of methodology. Let's use a common point of reference, but not dilute the gospel so that we can make our point and so that the people will hear us, so that the disciples will understand what it is we want them to learn. The content of our character is we say no so that we can say yes, and in so doing, our, image, our character is shaped into the image of Christ. Now, the second major point I want to draw from this passage is the reality of sanctification. The reality of sanctification. We have the content of our character. Now we have the reality of sanctification. It's already, but not yet. Already, but not yet. Paul explicitly states that it is possible, it is actually required for the disciple to live like this in the present. Verse 12, the end of 12, he says, in the present age, these are the lives we are supposed to live. But then he points to the future, to the process of completion, of what we are hoping for, of where we are going. And he says, we're waiting for our blessed hope. While we're living like this in the present age and we're training for godliness and upright living and self-control, we're waiting for our blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of, the, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just make a note of that verse, of verse 13, because our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is one of the clearest statements of the deity of Christ in the New Testament. That point is not specifically related to our teaching today, but, but it's so important, I just have to draw it to your attention. Because here Paul is, Paul is claiming the deity of Christ in what could not be more explicit language. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's so cool to me. I just want to tell you that. So even though our lives even though it's clear that our lives are supposed to increase in self-control and uprightness and godliness now... The fact that we're training at all clearly reminds us that sanctification is a process, is it not? Tonight we're covering the process of salvation in the uh, major Bible doctrines class. I know I'm pitching the class a lot because it's my last chance to teach tonight. Derek's going to be back and he's going to, the professional is going to take over. But tonight we're covering salvation. It's a huge topic, but one of the area, one of the aspects we're going to deal with is sanctification. The process by which we are conformed to the image of Christ. So come and ask your questions on, on salvation tonight. So here we have entry into the life of discipleship and growth as a disciple, living that life both contrasted uh, as we see God does two things. He does two things. He redeems us and he purifies us in verse 14. He redeems us in that he removes our sin and he purifies us in that he makes us holy. You see that? It's both an act and a process. It's both an act and a process. Redeems us, purifies us. All of it we know from Paul's previous statement is by the grace of God. It's God's grace working in us that this happens. Redemption, purification, the act and the process of God to teach us and to conform us to his image. There's a lot of things we could say about that. We don't have time to say them all. But there's two things I want you to see from verses 12 to 14. The first is that the good works that result, the good works that result are not, are not prerequisites for discipleship. They come as a result of discipleship. We're going to talk about this in more detail next week when we talk about maturity, the fruit of discipleship. But sufficient to say now that we are not being taught here, the teaching is not to do good works. The teaching is to develop our character. Good works are the result. So what I'm saying is that we're not disciples because we do good works. We do good works because we're disciples. More to come on that next week. One final thing uh, I want to say, and then we're going we're to move on to our next point. The content of our character... The content of our character allows us to say no so that we can say yes. But the process of character development is both an act and a process. It's both God redeeming us and wiping away our sins and purifying us so that we can become holy, so that we can become what? His possession. His possession. It's for his glory that this process of sanctification is even taking place. Michael Wilkins, in his landmark book on discipleship, really captures this well when he says this. Since discipleship implies a process of growth, scholars suggest that it in, in its broadest sense, discipleship is the metaphor most descriptive of the doctrine of progressive sanctification. This is important because it emphasizes that our entire life is to be brought into the discipleship process. 
If we do not bring our entire life into the discipleship process, says Wilkins, we run the danger of compartmentalizing and or dichotomizing our Christian lives. What does that mean? Compartmentalizing our Christian life means you're a Christian and you're a disciple in here, but not when you leave this room. It means there are two, it means people would not recognize the person that you are on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, throughout the week compared to the person that you are on Sunday. It means that there are different spheres of life and that discipleship is not infiltrating your entire life. But Wilkins has drawn the conclusion from his study of discipleship that discipleship is the Christian life. And yes, it is a process, but it is also the ministry of the church. Everything that we do is part of the discipleship process. It's not just a special program for the super spiritual. It's not just taking the baptism class. It's not just having a mentor, a spiritual mentor. Discipleship is everything that we do and all of those things too. You being here right now is discipleship because you're, you're, you're subject to teaching. Taking your kids to Sunday school is discipleship, both for you and for them. Participating in the choir is discipleship. Participating in the musical is discipleship. Serving in the kitchen is discipleship. At City, we've determined that the purpose of our small groups is to be the primary means of discipleship in our body. But that doesn't mean it stops there. It means in a church of this size, we need a vehicle for being the core. That's small groups. But discipleship fans into all the ministries of discipleship. One consequence of this, by the way, is that the primary purpose of our small groups is not, is not for emotional therapy. It's not for socialization. It's not for venting frustrations. Although all those things probably do happen in a small group, and it's not bad that they do. It's good. But the primary purpose of our small group is what? To become like Jesus. You want to know whether your small group is, is, is reaching its objective? Are you becoming more like Jesus? That's what we are striving to do in all of our ministries, to make people more like Jesus. There's a direction to the journey. Remember last week? There's a direction. There's a goal. There's an outcome. It's to be like Jesus. So in verse 14, it says he redeemed us so that he could purify us, so he could make us like himself. so that he can make us like him. Well, the third and final thing I wanna say as our time is getting short comes from entirely verse 15. We talked about the content of our character. We talked about the process of sanctification. I want us to talk to you now about the importance of our teaching, the how. If the bulk of this passage is concerned with the what, verse 15 is concerned with the how. And you have, you have a progressive narrowing of focus. The whole chapter, chapter 2, is talking about all of this teaching that we do in the church. Then you have 11 to 15 that's specifically talking about the theology. The language is elevated, elevated. He starts to narrow down and say, this is the really important theological stuff. Then verse 15 comes, and he says, this is the summary of it all, and this is how you're going to actually do it. And it's really simple. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So here's how it's intended to be done. Here's how teaching in the life of the disciple is intended to be done. Number one, our teaching in the church should be bold. Should be bold. Verse 1 and verse 15 are kind of like bookends on this passage. Uh, verse 1 of Titus chapter 2 says, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then and if you have the NIV, you'll notice that verse 15 says, this is what you should teach. It's bookending the, 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 the uh, chapter. Now, even though in the ESV, it actually uses a different word. It says declare these things. The word is actually the same in verse 1 and verse 15. So he's emphasizing. He's hugging, this, he's hugging this passage of Scripture by saying, this is what's important. However, I like, I like the fact that he says declare in verse 15 because it captures the intensity it captures the intensity that is built up as we move through the end of this chapter. Declare these things. Our teaching should be bold. Here's what you need to teach, and you gotta teach it with clarity, with conviction, with emphasis. One very important characteristic of our teaching in the church is it must be bold. 
You remember some years ago there was a movement amongst churches uh, called the seeker-sensitive movement. Our programs were developed toward, programs were developed towards being seeker-sensitive. One, of, one Christianity Today writer named Dorothy Greco categorizes seeker-sensitive as this. Services originally promised to woo postmoderns back into the fold. Out the stained glass window went the somewhat formal 45-minute exegetical sermon, replaced by a shorter story-based talk to address the felt needs of the congregation while reinforcing the premise that following Jesus would dramatically improve the quality of their life. The problem is that today most would admit that the seeker-sensitive movement didn't work very well because the seekers wanted something different. They already experienced the bankruptcy of a culture that told them it could improve the quality of their lives by giving them focus within themselves and giving them autonomy and giving them things to strive for. They already realized that wasn't working. That's why they came to church. They wanted us to be different. They want to hear the gospel. They want to know the way. They want to hear about the cost of discipleship. That's what the church is supposed to do. It's supposed to tell them the truth. That they'll never be able to be good enough to do it themselves, to pull themselves up by their philosophical bootstraps. They need a savior. The gospel needs to be bold. It needs to be clear. And it needs to be taught unreservedly in the church. Number two, our teaching should be encouraging. Encouraging. You see... We're called to encourage disciples. That's the way you teach them. You need to build up the church in our teaching so that they will know and they will be positively reinforced in the direction that they are going. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 describes the New Testament worship service by saying, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things done for building up. Let all things be done for building up. Hebrews 10, 24, consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, there's the hope tied in again. The work of the church is to positively reinforce disciples, all the while keeping in focus the truth of the content and the boldness of the delivery. The content is not to be watered watered down, but the methodology is to be building up. That's how you teach children, isn't it? We don't want to break down our kids when we're teaching them. We want to build them up. We want to encourage them. We want to move them along the way. We teach them what is right, but when they, when they do right, we say, great job. But there's a flip side to that, isn't there? There's another side of that, of that coin. And guess what? Paul says it just like we do as parents. You have to correct the disciple when they stray off of the path. So he says, encourage, exhort, and rebuke. Rebuke is correction. Rebuke is not supposed to be a rare occurrence in the church. It's supposed to be part of the process of discipleship training. It's regularly included in the scripture right alongside encouragement when it comes to methodology. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom. So the word is the content. Don't let the word be diluted. But where teaching and admonishing go hand in hand, it's all done in the context of worship with a thankful heart. That's the church. That's what we do. We're often soft on rebuke in the church, aren't we, a little bit? We don't want to rock the boat, get too involved in that situation, make someone feel uncomfortable, maybe make ourselves feel uncomfortable. But Paul is clear. If you are doing the teaching of character, of discipleship, you're going to need to correct the disciple when he goes off course. So teaching is bold, it's encouraging, it includes rebuke. Teaching also comes with authority. Now this is a tough one a little bit. Because it's easy as a disciple to sit in church and listen to the preaching of the word and say something like, man, that preacher has no idea what's going on in my life. He doesn't have authority to talk to me. How does he know what's happening with me? Sermon illustration cuts a little bit too close to the core all of a sudden we start thinking about how we could have delivered that message a little better. I might not have put it exactly quite like that. We think that pastor doesn't have authority over me. That small group leader doesn't have authority over me. That Sunday school teacher doesn't have authority over me. You know what? You're right. 
But Jesus does. Jesus does. That's why he begins his great, his great commission by saying, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, so I'm going to give it to you and tell you to go. Go and make disciples and teach disciples with the authority of Christ. He gives his authority to the overseers of the church to train up a people for his very own, a people who have sound doctrine, who live self-controlled lives, upright and godly-oriented towards God because they've been encouraged and rebuked and corrected properly, justly, and with his authority, not my authority. That's teaching. That's teaching discipleship. Paul's passing the authority of Christ to Titus here. He's reminding him that when he teaches on behalf of the master, he teaches with his authority. It's a great responsibility. But it's one we're called to. We're called to teach with authority. The final thing about teaching in the church is that it needs to include everyone. See that last phrase in verse 15? Let no one disregard you. I didn't say teaching should cater to everyone. I said teaching should include everyone. Everyone who is a disciple should be subject to the teaching. What that means is if you are a disciple, meaning if you are a Christian, because we know from last week the cost of discipleship that becoming a believer is becoming a disciple. If you are a Christian and you consider a city center your home church, then you are accountable to submit to the teaching of the church. That's what what Paul says. Paul says to Titus, don't let anyone disregard the teaching that you give as the overseer of the churches in Crete. Friend, brother, sister, fellow believer, fellow disciple, teaching in the church is not a consumer product for us to take or leave according to our preferences. We disciples subject ourselves to the teaching of the church, to the teaching of the word of God that comes through his church so that The life of the disciple is a life lived within the church, connected to the body, participatory, educational, transformational, as a journey together with the destination being the blessed hope of eternity with the master. You're required to pay attention is basically what Paul is saying. Not to me, but to the teaching that comes by the grace of God. To the teaching that comes with the authority of Christ, the teaching of his word, the Holy Spirit impressing it upon your heart. As disciples, we are subject to the teaching that comes by the grace of God through the church. Teaching in the church needs to be bold. It needs to be clear. It needs to be encouraging. It needs to be corrective. It needs to be authoritative. And it needs to be for everyone, for every disciple to submit to the process of shaping your character through the teaching of the spiritual, of the spiritual realities that Jesus has for you. This is the how. How do we we learn to get rid of ungodliness and worldly desires? How do we learn self-control, upright living? How do we teach this? We do it by boldly declaring the scriptures, by encouraging the disciple when he makes progress, by correcting her quickly when she strays off course, by doing it with the strength of Christ's authority, and making sure that he listens. That's a very practical formula for teaching. Present the way clearly, encourage progress, correct when wrong, do it firmly, and make sure he's listening. It's a very practical formula for teaching, and that's how we're supposed to be disciples. That's how we're supposed to learn as disciples. I have two really quick applications, and then I'm done. If you are part of the body of Christ then it is incumbent upon you to be both a teacher and a learner. If you are part of the body of Christ, it is incumbent upon you to be both a teacher and a learner. What that means is you need to embody these principles as you teach, whether you are teaching in a Sunday school class or you're teaching in your home, you're teaching your children in your home to be better disciples, to grow in the way of Christ. This is what you need to know and this is how you need to do it. It is incumbent upon you to teach. We have lots of opportunities to teach for those who are, who, who, for those who teaching is a calling from God. Lots of opportunities to teach. God calls us to teach in different contexts, to teach in different circumstances. 
but he also tells us how to teach. This is how we do it. When we are teaching, we're representing him. If you're a member, by the way, of the church, if you're a member of this church, by, by a member, I mean a member who's been, who has applied for membership and been voted on as a member, maybe teaching is one of the things that you, you want to serve in doing. We need children's ministry teachers. Our church has grown so much that our children's ministry program is bursting at the seams. We need more teachers. We've got excellent, godly, upright living, and self-disciplined teachers in our Kingdom Kids ministry right now. We could use more. So if you're, do- if, you're, if you're sound in doctrine, if you're mature as a believer, able to teach, gifted accordingly, maybe that's, something that, maybe that's something God's calling you to do. Maybe you need to talk to someone about that. If you're part of the body of Christ, it's incumbent upon you to teach. It is also incumbent upon you to learn. You also need to be a learner. And I want to just challenge you this morning to say, if you, are, if you are a disciple of Christ and you're not in a small group, why not? Why would you not take that opportunity that this local body, the body to which you subscribe as, a, as, a, as an adherent of this church, why would you not be in a small group if, we're, if, if, if we have determined that we're going to start our discipleship process through small groups? And there's, lots of, there's lots of ways that we can be discipled. And we want to provide lots of opportunities to do that. But th- here's a foundational way. Here's a way that we know is good, we know, we know works. I want to challenge you this morning. If you're not in a small group, starting in September when we relaunch our small group uh, ministry and we get back together, we reconvene after the summer recess, why not get in a small group? Why not talk to Pastor Drew? He's, he's, right, he's sitting right at the back of the room. He's waiting for you to come and talk to him and say, I want to be in a small group. I think we should think about that. I think we should consider that. Because it's incumbent upon us as believers to be teachers and to be learners. To make and teach disciples. Well, maybe you're not yet part of the body of Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a disciple. Maybe you're living a life that's trying to find character and meaning in what other people say, or worse yet, in what you yourself say and how you yourself define it. Maybe it's leaving you confused. Maybe it's leaving you with a feeling of moral bankruptcy. If that is you this morning, I want to challenge you too. I just want to say to you simply, why not, why not become a disciple? Why not come to Jesus, to the master, so that you can start having your character shaped by him? You know what he's going to do? He's going to redeem you. He's going to remove your sin. And then he's going to purify you. He's going to start you on that process of shaping you to be more like him, to have the character of the disciple. And you know what? He's going to end up in eternity forever. You're going to end up in eternity forever with him. That's the life of a disciple. And that's for you this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the clarity and the truth of your word. Thank you for the power of your gospel and the power of your call, drawing people to yourself. We know that on our own we would never seek you. We know that on our own, we could never save ourselves. You have done for us what we could never do is provide a way back to fellowship with you. Thank you. Thank you for this indescribable gift and for the life that comes with it, the life of a disciple, the life of shaping our character to be like you. We say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Create in us a new heart, a new desire to live for you follow you all the days of our lives to be your disciples and to make and teach disciples in accordance with the expansion of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name.